there were times along the way where I knew that it wasn't right, I knew that it needed to stop, and I knew that I wanted it to stop, but I couldn't. It was kind of like the elephant in the room. Everybody knew it was there, and it may or may not happen, but it was almost like it was okay. going in back of that dresser and just hiding for a long time. I was hiding there because I didn't want to be alone. I didn't, my whole family had left me there. This is our family and this is our business and we take care of this and we don't talk about it and you don't tell anybody and we'll deal with it. I said to her, I said, Mom, why did you leave me there? Mother, didn't you know that he was going to do this to me, Mom? from inside our, my childhood. It was not what people would expect. We looked like we were a really great family um, with a lot of really cool things and, and went a lot of great places. From the outside, Lauren Book appeared to have it all. The daughter of a prominent attorney and Florida lobbyist, Lauren and her family were close. As much of a type A personality as I am, Lauren and I had a very, very close relationship as a father and a daughter often as a rule have. There was not a day that, that, that I didn't know the things that went on in her day. Um, very open, very communicative, um, no secrets that I would have possibly believed could be in her life. We, the kids, were a tight unit and that was until Waldy came into the home and she worked very hard to drive a wedge between my sister and I. Um, and once that occurred, uh, we were a very fragmented family. We had our secrets, and we were told to keep those secrets. Waldi is Waldina Flores, a nanny hired by the Book family to take care of the children. She came with sterling recommendations from the agency. Uh, they knew her. They knew her past employers. They knew that she was impeccable. They knew she had no issues that we should or would or ought to be concerned about. We felt like at the point in time that she was coming into the house was a time at which she could help the children with their studies. She could have fooled anybody. And I would just suggest to you that people who have bad motives can usually come off one way, but they can be something very different. While these motives were different, as she began working with the Book family, she victimized Lauren in multiple ways. The abuse from Wally was, was three parts. There was the physical abuse um, when she didn't get the sex that she wanted or the things that she wanted. Um, and that would include beating me up, throwing me downstairs, pulling my hair, anything that she could do. Um, she never hit me where people would see. There was the verbal abuse. Uh, never thought that I was good enough. Never thought that I was worthy of anything. Um, you steal a child's identity when this happens. Um, so I never thought that I was worth even talking about it. And um, the sexual abuse, she used objects, she you know, defecated on me, urinated on me, anything that she wanted to do to further her, you know, her sexual pleasure, gratification, and anything that, anything that would give her that end. Sexual abuse doesn't always come from outside the home. Statistics show 90% of child victims know their offender, with almost half of the offenders being a family member. This abuse also crosses all economic boundaries. 
we lived in definitely lived in poverty. You know, my mother was on public assistance, and you know,、uh, my father worked, or I guess, off the books. And、uh, and I had two older brothers, and life was、uh, it was interesting. With both parents trying to make ends meet, Roberto would be left in the care of another family member, who began abusing him at an early age. I was put under his care. We were playing. He was taking care of me. We started wrestling, and、um, to not get too dramatic and too、uh, back into that moment, he raped me. And for a long, long time, I、uh, I would tell myself that I didn't,、um, that I wasn't raped, that I let that happen to me, that nothing happened to me, that I didn't let happen to me. And then it became kind of a casual thing, and then it wasn't so much. Uh, forced anymore, as it was coerced. And then I can remember even even as a child looking for that same affection. Then afterwards, getting used to it, <sighs>、um, and actually wanting it because it was a form of affection. It was a form of love. There was so much、uh, incest going on in my family that I wasn't like the only victim. It was it was like、um, you know, don't go to Uncle Johnny's room alone. You know what I mean? Like family knew, we knew, and it, it was just, it was, you know, you don't talk about it, you know, you, you watch the kids, you try to be careful, but everyone commingled. Like Roberto, Susan Rubio Rivera was also victimized by members of her own family. A third-generation Mexican American, Susan's childhood was shattered from the very beginning. I was.、Um, Five years old when we, when my mother finally decided to leave my dad, who was very abusive. There isn't a whole lot of memories other than、um, just bad stuff because we were all witnesses of, of the domestic violence and the beatings that my mother suffered. What I can remember, it's、um, it, it happened. I think right after we started living with my grandpa. My grandpa also was a, a Mexican American, Mexicano, very controlling, very domineering. All the family would be in this one little room, sitting room, watching TV, and he would be here in front of in front of everybody. He would sit there, and then he would sit one of us on his lap, and then he would put his blank a blanket over him, and he would start abusing us in front of everybody. I don't know if anybody knew what was going on.、Uh, now, as an adult, I think back to those times, and I say, how could you not know? How could you not know? In trying to come to terms with these devastating experiences, victims undergo a range of emotions. Defining sexual abuse can often be the first step to understanding it. Sexual abuse is not about sex. It is a, an act of aggression, and it has to do with power and control over another person. It is never the victim's fault. This power and control. Begins with a process called grooming, in which the victim is manipulated by the abuser in order to achieve his or her goals. Grooming is a gradual process that a perpetrator will develop with the victim. They will take the victim to special places, special activities, maybe be involved in their、um, extracurricular activities or school.、Uh, the The perpetrator will、um, give them special treats, buy them gifts, make them feel they're special, and build that that emotional bond with the victim. Basically, it would be a hug, a long a long touch.、Um, I didn't say anything. She knew when she did those little things to test boundaries, to test the relationship, that I didn't go talk to my parents. Um, and it doesn't just—it's not just with touching. It's special attention. It's getting to sit in the front seat all the time. It's des extra dessert. It's ten minutes more of TV, twenty minutes more of TV, which to you or I at this point doesn't seem like a big deal, but to a child it does, especially to a child who's starving for attention. She also worked on her grooming process with my parents.、Um, they could always trust her. They knew that they could. Uh, she stopped taking days off, so she was always there at the house, making sure that everything was okay. As this grooming process evolves into abuse, the effects can manifest in a variety of ways, depending on a person's nature. 
each person responds to the sexual abuse in their own way. Uh, however, there are three basic behaviors that we do categorize it into, and that is the sexualized behavior, the internalized behavior, and the externalized behavior. For externalized behavior, which we often find in boys, there you see more aggressive acting out, more maybe hurting themselves or hurting others, having difficulty with authority, getting into trouble with the law, uh, possibly breaking things, becoming physically aggressive, just in general. And by the sixth grade, I was convicted for my first felony on attempted murder charges. I had stabbed the young man because he had hit me. Um, and I mean, you know, while all this is going on, I was, I was being, I was in a sexual pedophilic relationship with a 50-year-old man. As a way to cope with the turmoil inside of him, Roberto began to act out. I would have different masks. I would have different outfits I would wear. Through my adolescence, one of the outfits I wore was promiscuity. I became very promiscuous with young ladies. You know, I had to have a lot of girlfriends to validate my masculinity, to make me feel like a man, um, to, uh, to be rid of the feelings that somehow, um, am I homosexual, am I heterosexual? One of the other masks was aggression, hostility, you know, anger, rage. You know, if I'm the toughest, if I'm the baddest, you're not gonna touch me. You can't get close enough to me to be intimate with me to hurt me again. The internalized behavior, which we often find more with girls, is where they may socially withdraw. If they're younger, they may regress back to a baby talk or maybe their toilet training um, is also goes back. And for older uh, children who internalize it, they may um, have eating disorders or they may also excel in uh, their schoolwork and their extracurricular activities because they feel that this is a way to kind of run away from the problem. I had a lot of survival techniques um, that, that I had from very young. Um, I was a super child, which, you know, it can go either way. A child can be, you know, act out or they can act in. Um, I acted in. I was stu super straight A, like straight arrow, was at school when it started at 8 at 7 o'clock because I didn't want to be late and wanted my books and read my notes and, and, and that's how I was able to, to maintain that life. School was a way out of my home. Sexualized behavior is when you see um, an excessive amount of masturbation, when they're acting seductively, and also uh, possibly uh, promiscuity, especially in older children. Uh, younger children may try to act out in sexual ways with younger or smaller children. I think that in, as a kid, it really affected me because at the age of five, when my grandpa started, and at the age of seven, my whole sexual being was awakened. So I used to believe that I was a really nasty little girl. You know, I used to just, you know, I used to just act differently. I mean, I had a lot of boyfriends when I was a teenager, and, you know, I had like no, no self-respect, no, you know, it didn't matter to me. As each of them struggled to live their lives, suffering alone in silence, there comes a defining moment in which they eventually face their demons. It is at this turning point their healing begins. Lauren had been in therapy for months, but never revealed her secret until one day when she was faced with an ultimatum by her boyfriend. He saw bruises on parts of my body that should not have been there um, and kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And eventually I told him what was going on. And after some time he said, look, if you don't tell your father today, I will tell him tomorrow. I went to Dr. Levine and I said, Dr. Levine, you can't tell my parents this. I just need to tell you this. I need help. I need to get out of this situation and I need you to help me. And he looked at me like, what the heck is going on? I've been seeing him for six or six or seven, eight months, something like that. And he just was kind of, you know, blown out of the water a little bit. And um, he then called my father. And said, and, and said, look, there's a situation at home I need to share with you um, about Waldy and Lauren. That morning was almost dizzying. 
almost like being in the middle of a storm in the middle of the ocean, trying to keep the boat from capsizing. He went and told my father first. And I remember, and the plan was that I would come there after my dad had been there and heard so we could all come up with the plan. And um, so I showed up at 7.45, 8 o'clock, walking into the room and hearing my dad wailing, screaming, crying is something that I'll never forget. And, and walking into the room and him simply saying, sorry, Pipper, I'm so sorry. I leaned over, I hugged her, I told her things would be okay. I understand a parent's rage. Uh, I, I, I get it, I get it. And it took me a very long time. It took me almost a year to fully process that this was, in, well, I thought it was the worst thing, that a parent could suffer. Waldy had fled um, before um, the police were able, able to pick her up. And she fled to Oklahoma where she had a girlfriend. Um, when she was found, she was found coaching 10-year-old little girls in soccer. For Susan, confronting her abuse came later in life, after the death of her grandfather. I had been married for the second time now for at least a couple of years or so. And, um, and I remember that I was in bed with my husband and I opened my eyes and I, and I saw my grandpa. Um, and I started just hitting my, my husband. I says, get off, get off of me, get off of me, leave me alone, get off of me. I mean, I went totally, completely, completely crazy. The floodgates just opened. That's how my abuse came back into my life. That's how the memories, they all started just rushing in. Had an anxiety attack really, really bad. That's what took me into therapy. That's when we started really dealing with my sexual abuse. And that's when I was able to to really put blame where blame goes. I think that as, a, as an adult, um, my relationship with my children was just really affected. I think that um, I remember that I was always, you know, the, the aunt that rocked the children, you know, my nephews to, you know, because I love to sing. So I would sing to them or I would tell them stories. And, but after a while, after they got to a certain age, the age of seven, um, I, I couldn't anymore. I mean, I was so scared that, that I was going to grow up abusing my own children. So it was very, very difficult for me to show love to my kids because somehow I felt that I had this monster inside of me and that one of these days the monster is going to come out and I don't want to. I didn't want to. Having never really dealt with his sexual abuse, Roberto, now a parent himself, was forced to face his worst fears when his three-year-old daughter revealed to him an inappropriate game she was taught by another family member. And I looked at her, and inside, I felt so much pain. And I held it, and I looked at her and I smiled. And I said, sweetie, who taught you that game? And she said, Uncle Johnny taught me that game. And I said, wow, honey, thank you. You're so brave for telling me about this game you're playing. And I scooped her up, and I held her in my arms again. And I said, Daddy can't play this game with you, baby. Daddy loves you very much, and this is not a game you can play anymore. And daddy's gonna make sure you never play this game again. Oftentimes, when a child comes and discloses that they have been abused, the parent, uh, this will be a trigger for the parent, and then the, the, and then the parent is suddenly dealing not only with their child's sexual abuse, but their own past history of sexual abuse. I learned that when I face my demons and my monsters, they're not as scary as I thought they were. They're just things that happen. And what can I do with that experience? How do I take that thing which happened to me, which was so horrendous and horrific, that which happened to my daughter, how do I take that and utilize it for something good? I do is I help other people to heal. I tell my story. And I let men know 
that we heal, we recover, we get better, that the lie is dead, that we are loving, caring, gentle, compassionate, understanding, empathetic, gentle, soft men who can stand strong and be right. Standing beside Roberto during his transformation is his life partner, Susan Barbini. Their relationship has been nothing short of a whirlwind experience, with both of them learning how to navigate their feelings through the lasting effects this abuse has left behind. He has so many different facets of who he is. He's very strong, very powerful. There's a part of Roberto that's very um, frightened to be vulnerable. There's so many different things. I know the kind, compassionate, understanding, caring, dynamic, powerful, Victor, beautiful man that he is. I allow people to get to know who I am. I welcome you into my home and I say, this is it. This is how I live. Nothing's hidden. Everything is laid out so everybody could see. And that's one of the ways. His continued willingness and desire to be better um, to touch the community, to touch people's lives. I mean, I, I love that about him, so that inspires me, and that's, that's pretty much who I am. Um, so I think together we work very well together because that's what we love to do. We love to talk to people, we love to share, we love to bring people to a better place. At the same time as continually reaching out to bring ourselves to a better place. Changing lives seemed to be the destiny for Susan. Years of working for a nonprofit community agency helping migrant workers led her to open her own organization 15 years ago called Mujer, a one-stop domestic violence and sexual assault treatment center, providing comprehensive services to victims of abuse. My purpose is when I leave Mujer, Mujer is gonna be in a place where it's gonna, it's, it's an institution. It's gonna be here forever. So people come and go, but the institution has to, to stay because the institution is, I think, what really makes a difference. She's taken her agony and transformed it into something so powerful and so beautiful that um, she helps so many people. There's this tremendous feeling of of empathy that goes out and there's an enormous sense of respect. What you want to try to do in any community is to begin the dialogue because if there is no dialogue then there is no you're not going forward at all. So I mean I think that's what we've done really really well is is to incorporate the voice of people that have always been considered as voiceless or not having a voice into something that works. Finding shortcomings in the legal system, Lauren and her father began advocating for victims of sexual violence. This campaign led to the founding of Lauren's Kids, which aims to prevent sexual abuse through awareness and education. I started advocating and changing laws and working to make a difference for children and families that we found were wrong with the system. From then on, it was constantly working to make Florida in the country a safer place for our children. From the very beginning, putting our heads in the ground wasn't an option. Hiding in a closet wasn't an option. Sweeping it under the rug wasn't an option. What we also found was talking about it, doing things about it, was healthy. Beyond the advocacy part, the awareness part that we do, um, is so important. Lauren's kids, um, you know, 95% of sexual abuse is preventable with education and awareness. Um, so the largest awareness campaign that we do is our walk. For a number of years, Lauren has walked across the state in an effort to raise awareness about childhood sexual assault. Her walk from Key West to Tallahassee included stops at different crisis treatment centers along the way. It was a really, really moving, incredible experience, and, and creating that awareness is so paramount. Um, it, it just, it opens your eyes to all the things that are out there. One of our missions is to make sure people pay attention to it, that we raise awareness, that we make sure that 
um, that, that communities, parents, counselors, teachers know what they need to know, but that resources from a law enforcement, a prosecutorial perspective, are put into this arena, that resources are put into counseling, that resources are put into healing people to survivorship. Now, that's part of what, what it is we do. I'm very blessed to have a lot of support. You know, I have um, my father, who's my number one ally in the fight, and we lock arms and we put our noses down. But I think that all the survivors I meet and all of the, the, the people that are in my life, um, those are all my support systems. You always want to be your kid's hero. You want to be that comic book Superman hero um, that they think about when they think about their childhood. Um, you never really think about your kid being your hero. You think about being their hero because that's what you're supposed to be. That's what you were taught you were supposed to be. Um, she is my hero. We have to bring it out in the open. That's the only way that we're going to be able to save children, especially children. Because even though I care a lot about all victims, to me, the kids. Because if we can stop abuse while they're young, before it happens, that's going to save them years and years and years of, of trauma. I will never forget the horrors of what happened to me, but they don't make me who I am. See, today I'm not a victim. And we can use the word survivor, but I am a victor because I have overcome. I've overcome that which, for most of us, keeps us trapped. Surviving, the true hardest part of abuse is not when you're in the abuse, it's when you're out of the abuse. When that person is out of your life, keeping that person out of your life, and healing and choosing every day to get up and make a difference.